Hi, everybody. We're just going to wait for people to join. Just another minute. Yeah, I think we can start. I'm Merit Sukovic. I'm, I'm uh, here with Catherine Small and Allison Dulat um, for the Healy ALS platform trial. And we have a special guest uh, today uh, to talk to us about biomarkers. So first of all, thank you for all joining. And it really it's a pleasure to, to welcome uh, Dr. Bob Bowser here to um, answer all your questions about biomarkers. Tell us a little bit about his work and why um, you know, fluid and other types of biomarkers are so important for accelerating ALS uh, research. So with that, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Bowser. Thanks so much, Merritt. And it's my pleasure to be here today. And and uh, hello to everyone uh, across the country, hopefully, uh, those at the end of the day. And like myself, I'm on the West Coast, so a little bit earlier today. But as Merritt mentioned, uh, I'm Bob Bowser. I'm at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, run my own lab, direct a research center here for ALS at the Barrow. And for probably over 25 years, I've been working on biomarkers related to ALS and really got into it because at that point, you know, we knew far less about mechanisms of disease. And we're really interested in trying to identify some of the underpinnings of ALS. And we thought, why not look at uh, biofluids from patients and use developing technologies at the time which included mass spectrometry to look at, pro at proteins, genomics, looking at DNA and RNA, and ask the question, can we see differences in, in ALS patients where, versus controls? They could be healthy controls, other disease controls. And how early in the disease can we see them? And could we use these then to help us identify mechanisms related to the disease that we can, that we can target with drugs and can we follow patients over time and monitor the impact of drugs using these same biomarkers? And so when I set out doing this, really, I started looking and using cerebral spinal fluid. And the rationale for that was, well, it's it bathes the brain and spinal cord, and therefore, it's a biofluid that is right around where the disease is happening. And if there are biomarkers, they be, might be most concentrated in the cerebral spinal fluid. And how can then how can we access that? And that's usually done using a lumbar tap to collect cerebral spinal fluid. And so we wor started working on CSF from ALS patients and controls. And my lab was one of the early ones identifying biomarkers that separate and distinct uh, distinctly from ALS patients and controls. And you know we're probably about the first in the field that use computer-based algorithms to mine complex data and identify biomarkers that distinguish ALS from controls. And so that led us on to multiple avenues of exploration, looking both at changes that occur between patients in different control groups, what happens over time. So the critical thing, we can identify and discover these biomarkers. We can ask if we see them in CSF, can we identify them in the blood? That's easier to collect from patients. And, but then importantly, we can start to ask questions around do any of them change over time? And how do they change? Maybe during ALS, they go up over time, or maybe they go down over time, or maybe they stay the same. These are really critical questions if we want to use these biomarkers in clinical trials to help tell us whether or not a drug is doing what it should be doing, maybe hitting its target in the central nervous system, maybe uh, changing pathways that are influencing how these biomarkers are released. And so based on that, then through efforts, uh, a lot through the Niels network of clinical sites, uh, me, myself and others started collecting samples from patients in various clinical research studies. And those might be single time points of blood and CSF. They might be longitudinal measures. Again, we really need to figure out how these change over time. And so we've been discovering quite a bit that have you know, not only led to new discoveries on mechanisms, but also enabling us to actually monitor patients and disease progression. And also now in clinical trials, and so many years ago, I wanted to start following biomarkers in every clinical trial. 
And it's fantastic that essentially we do that now. And we're using that, that type of information to really gain insight on whether or not the drug is having a biological impact on patients. Some of what we found are, are um, some of the early biomarkers that myself and others looked at, including proteins called neurofilaments, um, seem to be elevated in the cerebral spinal fluid. And then subsequently, we learned they're also higher in the blood of patients with ALS. And then when we took those longitudinal samples, again, collecting cerebral spinal fluid and blood from individual patients over time as they come into the clinic, we found neurofilaments really don't change. And so that's really important. So now we know that they stay fairly constant over time. And if we gave a drug that might reduce neuronal cell death, then maybe neurofilament proteins, because they're only expressed in neurons in the central nervous system, those levels might drop. And if we can demonstrate that that drug lowered the levels of a biomarker like neurofilament, that provides insight to, into not only the drug is getting into the central nervous system, but it's also impacting pathways that are probably protective of neurons. And now we can see the drop of this biomarker. And now we're about every company is including biomarkers in their uh, drug development process um, and in clinical trials. And I will also say that, you know, the discovery of these biomarkers have really influenced the number of drug companies that are interested in ALS. If we have better ways to identify patients, better ways to monitor patients um, longitudinally, and better ways to predict if their drug is having a treatment effect, more and more companies get interested in coming into the ALS world. And so it's been a very exciting sort of venture over the last few decades, uh, including, you know, Merritt, who introduced me, has been, um, you know, a collaborative partner over the many years on, on these efforts. And so it's been a very exciting time and I'm really gratified to see how biomarkers have really influenced the way in which that we perform clinical trials in the world of ALS and the value um, that, that we have in further collecting samples in longitudinal manners from patients. It's really critical that we continue these efforts in order to enable us and other companies around the world and researchers around the world to further advance ALS research. So with that, I'll pass it back to, to Merit or Sabrina. Thank you, Bob. You've been really like a, a leader in this field for a long time and it's coming all to fruition now in a great way. Um, I think Sabrina is gonna take it from here. Wonderful, and we are so excited to have you here, uh, Dr. Bowser. I think it's really great that um, we can take questions for you. So feel free to um, take, Put questions in the chat for Dr. Bowser. In the meantime, I'll provide the update. We uh, we get lots of questions about biomarkers, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, and I also want to share some of our resources that are available uh, for viewing or for or to download from our website. So, in particular, I think we uh, we have not really showed on this webinar the um, the great biomarker brochure that uh, some of our interns recently developed uh, with guidance for from our research team. Um, and so, if we can go. To the next slide, you can see sort of a, a screenshot of this and really a, a new resource to for people to learn more about biomarkers with links inside as well uh, to go to some of our other resources. So if you're interested in learning more about biomarkers, and I think many of you are, uh, since we, we received several questions about it, uh, again, we developed this new resource as a starting point uh, and we have other resources on our website and 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 also we, con we will continue to invite experts uh, on this webinar to, uh, to make sure that we can can take all, all your questions next week. Next slide. Um, and so just in terms of our regular weekly updates, um, as you know, we are now enrolling for two regimens, regimens F and G. Uh, both have a very um, extensive biomarker component to it for the reasons that were just mentioned. Incredibly important to leverage every trial uh, as an opportunity to learn more about biomarkers. And biomarkers can also teach us more about the, the, the effect of that particular drug. Next slide. 
And so uh, in order for us to do all these analyses, including uh, biomarker analysis, we need to complete enrollment first. Uh, we're making great progress on enrollment. Uh, and you can see here that uh, almost 300 people have been um, screened uh, or consented uh, to be part of uh, either Regimen F or Regimen G. Uh, and there is a process, there is sort of, you know, a screening process where people get their um, uh, their status evaluated and their labs evaluated to make sure that they are a good fit for, for these regimens, uh, mostly for safety reasons. And so as um, labs and assessments come back, then we can actually include them in the trial. And so far of these almost 300 people who have been screened, um, almost 200 have, have started the actual treatment uh, on, on, on either one of these regimens. So great progress on this. So thank you to all of you who are participating and helping us um, share news about the trial and really invite others to participate participate. Next slide. While we're making good progress on enrollment, uh, I do want to mention that we still have very uh, lots of spots available and and, and excellent uh, sites, uh, 60, uh, many sites right now that are active and receiving participants and a few more sites are being added uh, as we speak. So really um, lots of opportunities uh, for people to participate. Um, and, and so we have uh, really lots of spots for all of you uh, to, um, uh, to participate. Next slide. If you want to know which site is active near you, please use the, the links here. Uh, the contact information are also on our website and they are updated regularly. Uh, and uh, thank you to our team, the patient navigation team for really keeping everything up to date so that you can um, click on the link and, and really connect to the site of your choice. Next slide. Next week, actually, we won't be here uh, because of travel, but Catherine and Alison are always here uh, outside of this webinar, uh, able to answer your questions and connect you to sites. Uh, the links also connect you to our weekly webinars and our newsletter. Um, and, and so again, with that, uh, really uh, great to, to see all of you here. And now we can take your questions. I see questions are coming in and thank you so much Catherine also for posting uh, the list of uh, platform trial sites as well as a link to our brochures. We have many brochures including one about biomarkers um, and so that's um, that's really great uh, to the great resources on our website. So a question that um, we got in advance actually from from before this webinar uh, for Dr. Bowser. Uh, so what does it take for a biomarker to be considered a valid biomarker? So the person who asked commented that sometimes we hear about certain things being biomarkers and other things being valid biomarkers. So what makes it a good biomarker? Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. That's a great question. And so um, you can often see, you look in the literature, you look in newspapers, you know, every week, oh, there's a new biomarker for ALS or a new biomarker for other diseases. Well, that that's really a discovery step, part of the, uh, of the pathway. And so when you think of biomarkers, first one has to identify, discover them. Then one has to sort of what's called verify them. So can you replicate that in another study? And then further, you have validation, which really requires multiple investigators, usually around the world, that are studying that particular candidate biomarker. So when they come out, they really should be called candidate biomarkers. And now it takes the rest of the field to sort of work with that biomarker and actually perform more and more studies to demonstrate its value, demonstrate that, yes, what the initial investigators saw and reported that's actually occurs over and over and over again. So is it reproducible? When you get to that stage, now you have a biomarker that actually is, is validated, that many people around the country have seen it and, and demonstrate, yes, that that's a good marker for the disease. And then finally, you need to ask, how is that actually measured? Um, and different types of biomarkers are measured in different ways. And what's the methodology um, for that? And so that also sometimes has to be further validated. So it can actually take some time from the initial discovery of a candidate biomarker until we see a multitude of, of, of laboratories that reproducibly come up with the same result until downstream actually demonstrating that however it's being measured is a good and reliable platform to measure it. And so therefore you have not only the detection of it 
but you have an assay that you know performs really well. And so that that can act, that typically takes many years um, in the process. So when you see things right off the bat, that's really a candidate biomarker in a discovery phase until further more and more work is done on that biomarker to demonstrate its its validity and its uh, reliability in the ALS field. Great. So you mentioned that biomarkers can be used to clarify the mechanism of disease. And so the specific question for you is, which mechanisms are you targeting and which biomarkers are you investigating? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, probably the, the biggest at the moment really are looking at, um, you know, biomarkers like neurofilament, which are really involved in, in axonal or neuronal injury and death. And so now you're looking, can we uh, demonstrate the drug might drop levels of neurofilament as a demonstration that neur neurons and motor neurons in ALS are protected, that we're reducing or slowing the death uh, in injury of neurons. So we often look at other biomarkers involved around um, neuronal injury and survival. And we also look a lot around biomarkers that, that deal with inflammation. And so we know that inflammation is, is very important in ALS, it helps propagate the disease. So can we slow um, or, or reduce neuroinflammation? And so we usually look at a number of different biomarkers and inflammatory pathways to see if we're having an effect there. Great. So uh, one question about diagnostic biomarkers. So normally uh, labs can have outliers. So for example, there could be someone who has the values of the particular diagnostic biomarker uh, at normal levels, but still have ALS. Is it possible to have outliers and, and how do do account for it? Yeah, another good question. So there's always outliers. Um, no test is 100% accurate. And so we know that that is true. So you can definitely have outliers with any for any biomarker, and that goes not just for ALS, but any other disease. Um, in order to determine what is that percentage, what percent of my tests are essentially inaccurate, that are wrong, that you know I say might have ALS, but they don't, or the opposite, someone, uh, the test would say they don't have ALS, but they do. That requires a lot of work, and that's part of that sort of biomarker validation scheme, running that test on essentially hundreds, thousands of individuals in order to find out what is that predictive value of saying who has ALS and who doesn't. In the world of biomarkers, I typically never want to say, look at only one biomarker as being the end all of the biomarker paradigm. So yeah, one biomarker may in fact not predict that somebody has ALS or, or the reverse, but yet another one or two might say, yes, they probably do. And so then it becomes the combination of biomarkers and also how the neurologist, how the clinician is identifying the clinical parameters of the disease. And that's helping them make that final choice. Yes, it's ALS or no, it's not. Great. Speaking of mechanisms, there seems to be a gut brain connection and that could be connected to inflammation as well. So the person is asking, um, are there biomarkers of gut health or microbiome or, or stool? can something be measured in the stool? Yeah, that, we need more work in that area, actually. I think some of the early um, publications looking at the gut microbiome and ALS were a little inconclusive. And so, um, and since those, some of those publications came out, we've learned more and more about the gut microbiome and how to, how to actually measure it, um, so to speak. So um, I think, you know, the world of ALS is due to some more studies um, to further explore the gut biome uh, and, and determination of how early does it change? And is it a driver, as you said, Sabrina, of sort of, sort of some of the inflammatory reactions that might be propagating or exasperating the disease process. So um, the answer, unfortunately, is we don't have a great, uh, we don't know for certain um, the, both when the gut microbiome might be play a role in ALS and exactly how it participates in the disease process, but we need to learn more and more about that. So more work to, to come on the gut microbiome. Yeah. So if people want to contribute to biomarkers, but they're not in a trial, are there 
biomarker only studies or other ways to contribute to biomarker discovery other than being in a trial? Yes, there definitely are. So there are a number of different clinical research studies. So this is they're just enrolling patients that wish to provide um, biofluids, clinical information for research purposes. And so, yes, you cannot be in a clinical trial yet participate in this. And, and also very importantly is, you know, we need healthy controls. And so we need controls of, you know, if we're going to compare somebody in biomarkers that have ALS, what do we compare them to? You know, we need to compare them to other people, different age groups, especially. And so um, often in our clinical research studies, yes, we're enrolling ALS patients. We're often enrolling their spouses, uh, other family members as controls within that. So there are active programs um, that are enrolling patients for these types of clinical research studies. That's great. And so I think it, it's very valuable. I know uh, our audience often includes um, caregivers or family members who oftentimes ask how they can help. And, and this would be a great way to help, to really help ALS research, even if someone doesn't have ALS or is not in a trial. Uh, question. So let's say the biomarker is developed. So then what would it take for the FDA to recognize the new biomarker as a valid endpoint for trials uh, to support a new drug? And and a, a separate question in the same from the same person could the could the platform trial results actually support a new biomarker that's accepted by the FDA? Um, yeah. So for the last part of that question, absolutely. And so again, as part of the Healy platform trials biomarkers were built in both to provide information to the sponsor and about that particular drug trial, but also as a research tool to further advance our knowledge of biomarkers um, in the ALS space. So data is going to be, is being generated from the Healy platform trials that will ultimately be used, I think, in helping the FDA come to conclusions regarding the value of biomarkers, of particular bi biomarkers, um, within the field. And um, so that's the back end of the question. So the front end of how hard is it to get FDA buy-in is actually quite challenging. And so, uh, you know, and I've been to the FDA around some of these questions and it's, you know, exactly what's the, what's the use of that biomarker? And you mentioned diagnostics. Okay. That could be one use. It could be a prognostic predicting, um, you know, the, the survival, predicting the course of disease within an individual. It could be predicting a response to a particular drug. So there are lots of potential uses and you have to go to the FDA with specifically what is the use of that biomarker, just like a drug. The drug is being used for a particular disease. And so similarly with biomarkers, you're going to the FDA around what's the potential use of that biomarker. Now, even with neurofilaments, which to date is probably the best biomarker for ALS, the question becomes, do we really need um, the FDA to approve neurofilaments as a biomarker for ALS? And you know, I used to think that's probably the case, but I don't think that's the case right now because of two things. One, um, scientists and, and other uh, investigators around the world see the same thing with, with respect to neurofilament in ALS patients. We know how it behaves um, in the patient population. Two, we have information in a couple of different clinical trials now on neurofilament. And the FDA is, is actually utilizing those biomarkers in helping guide their ultimate decision-making process. And so that's demonstrating there is FDA buy-in on this biomarker for particular reasons. And so going through a very long approval process, so you're, you would have to come up with um, prospective studies to demonstrate the validity of that biomarker for a particular use. And so it's like a clinical trial. So you have years of, stud of, of um, exposure and use in order, to, in order to really get FDA approval for that biomarker for that use. Well, all, we already have FDA buy-in on a biomarker. And so um, do we need to go through the additional years of efforts on neurofilament for ALS? Probably not. Um, maybe other biomarkers we will. But I think as more and more come um, as more as more and more evidence is presented around particular biomarkers, again, could be neurofilament or other proteins. It could be um, speech measures. It could, I mean, there's lots of different types of biomarkers. 
Um, as more and more data is produced around that and showing um, how uh, their potential role in clinical trials, um, we just have to get more and more investigators to provide that information to get buy-in for the FDA on their potential use in downstream ALS clinical trials. So there's a very technical question about neurofil neurofilament. You just mentioned <laughs> neurofilament, and I'm glad you're here because I would not be able to answer this very technical question. The question is about uh, second generation versus third generation test for neurofilament. Can can you tell us more about it? And I, I think uh, that there's a few different companies that offer different generation testing. Yeah, there's there's a multitude of companies that offer testing now for neurofilament, and. Um, by second, third generation, usually um, the, the going from the first to second is probably is increase in the sensitivity of the assay. And going to third, in this case for neurofilm, it was really putting it on different company platforms, as they're called. Um, and so now we have neurofilament measures on a few different what are called platforms from different companies. In essence, it's the same assay using essentially the same antibodies even. Uh, measuring neurofilament. And so um, while we have second and third generation assays, it's really measuring around the same molecule and, and using very similar antibodies. So, and they're generating very similar results. The absolute levels might differ because you're measuring it using a different platform, different system. The trend is the same. Everything is very similar. So regardless of it's second or third generation, we feel fairly confident that the data generated from those systems are, are reliable, reproducible, and, and validated. That's very important. Thank you. So switching gears a little bit, I have a question about recruitment uh, and so how to best connect with sites. Uh, we know that sometimes it may take a while to take uh, to hear back from sites. So I just wanted to make sure, first of all, um, if Catherine could help us uh, kind of, you know, um, tell us more about how people can connect with you uh, uh, to uh, then connect with sites, that, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. So um, I know the person who submitted that question is anonymous, but um, I'll ask you to email me first, but I know who you are, but you can email me directly. And then um, I am in touch with all of our sites nationwide. So if there's a site in particular that you're trying to get in touch with and you're having trouble making that connection, I'm happy to facilitate and kind of reach out on your behalf and get the wheels going there. But um, if it's just a matter of, you know, seeing which sites are available near you and you want me to help you know, figure out which one might have sooner availability, um, I can help on that front too. So kind of figuring out what you're looking for and then meeting you where you're at and, you know, we'll make that connection. Um, but yeah, I can absolutely help if you're having trouble connecting with a site near you. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'll, I'll leave uh, the final word. I'll give one, one opportunity to Dr. Kusukovic to tell us, you know, your thoughts tonight, this week for this update. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bowser for final words uh, about your hopes in biomarkers research. Well, I want to just thank people who are part of trials or biomarker research, because that's how we're going to understand this illness better and be able to screen therapies faster and get them approved faster. And Really, there's no one up uh, besides Bob Bowser who's been a champion of this for, uh, I don't want to give your age away, but maybe 20 <laughs> plus years and um, is really uh, the leader in, you know, in the world, if not you know, uh, not the whole atmosphere um, in, 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 in this. And it's, it's paying off now. And so I'm really excited to see what comes in the next year. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, Merritt. I guess the gray hairs give it away, but um yeah, no, it's incredibly exciting right now. And again, uh, thanks to everyone that participates in the trials, participates in clinical research studies, because that's how we gain so much more insight into the disease and ultimately bring more drugs to, to the clinic. Um, so that's really critical. And again, what I hope to see, you know, especially now with biomarkers really being included early on is can we come up with quick, you know, very fast go, no go types of decisions? And, you know, always one of the challenges in the field of ALS is, you know, thinking like baseball and Lou Gehrig, how many times do you come up the bat? And so if we can quickly, you know, weed through certain drugs that, you know, okay, this look kind of promising in other types of preclinical studies, we give it the patients and quickly decide with biomarkers, you know, it's not really doing what we hoped. 
Can we then pivot those patients into another clinical trial? And so let's get them another time at bat with their disease. And to me, I think downstream, that's what I really want to see as we go forward, allowing patients more and more at bats. Fantastic. That that was great. So we, we won't be here next week. We'll be here in two weeks right after Labor Day. I see that there is a, a last minute question about how to administer the drug. I would uh, ask you to please contact Catherine so that they can put you in touch with the sites uh, to, to, to discuss uh, procedures. Specifically, the, the, the question is if some drugs can be administered via feeding tube. And, and for most drugs in the, in the trial, yes, that's been possible, but there are some differences depending on the exact regimen. So it would be good to have a more detailed conversation about that. Um, and so thank you so much, ev everyone. And this was really great. And I'm sure we'll invite you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.